Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, January 10th, 2016. This is episode 1252. Enjoy! The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the simplest way to create a landing page or a beautiful website for your portfolio, your blog, your business, your online store, your soon-to-open Broadway play. Go to Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com and enter the offer code TECHGUY to get 10% off Squarespace. Build it beautiful. And by Epson and the new Epson EcoTank printers with Epson's line of Super Tank all-in-one printers. You could print thousands of documents without running out of ink. EcoTank is loaded and ready to print when you are. Visit epson.com slash ecotank to find out more. And by the Ring Video Doorbell with Ring you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your home. Right now, get free expedited FedEx shipping when you go to ring.com slash tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography and Smartphones and smartwatches and all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO is the number if you want to talk high tech. Anything with a chip in it. 888-827-5536. That's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. You know, it's funny because uh, CES, the, the formerly Consumer Electronics Show, now CES, they say, stands for nothing. It's just, it's just a word, CES. Uh, is just ended a couple of days ago, and already I've moved on in my mind. I have no. <laughs> it's like okay, what do we see at CES? I suppose you probably want to know. Did, was there anything exciting? You know, CES hasn't had anything exciting in in, a, in some time. I think the most exciting uh, thing, at least if you read the tech blogs, was a refrigerator from Samsung that has a camera inside, so you could see if your food is spoiled or disappeared or you need more milk oh excuse me i'm sorry I'm having a hard time paying attention what the uh okay new computers yeah a few new computers gaming com it's, it's computing hasn't been that interesting in a while smartphones no because nobody no smartphone company announces uh, or some, many most don't even show at ces i know it's it was the consumer electronics show but uh, no those particular forms of consumer electronics don't show up there. They're, they're going to be at Mobile World Congress and other places. You know what happened? Big companies realized, why should we make big announcements in this buried in this sea of dreck, of dross, of flotsam and jetsam, and be buried in it when we could have our own event later <laughs> and, and talk about it then? Something that car companies haven't quite realized yet. You know, the big Detroit auto show starts next week, but for some reason... I think because car companies want uh, you to, us to think of them as consumer electronics, they decided uh, Ford announced a few things, including the support for Android and Apple's uh, smartphones, Android Auto and CarPlay, the two brand names, so that you can just get in your car and the display on the screen and will be the smartphone display, not a special car display. Uh, Ford announced the, it would be interfacing to the Amazon Echo, which is a strange little device that people seem to love. I love it. Uh, I think that the tech community loves it. It's a little tube that you talk to in your in your kitchen or your bedroom, and now you'll be able to say, start my car, which seems a little dangerous. But I guess in the, in the coldest areas of the world, it's nice if you could start your car early uh, before you get into it, warm it up a little bit. Start my car. Hey, Echo, start my car. I could say that now. I can already say, say, hey, Echo, how much gas is left? That's kind of, I guess that's semi-useful. Virtual reality became sort of a reality. Oculus Rift, which is the company Facebook paid billions for, said, yes, you'll be able to buy our Oculus Rift headset. It's on uh, 
pre-order now. I ordered mine immediately. It says They said it'll come in May. What is the longest period of time that you can take somebody's money for before delivering a product? Five months seems a long, seems a long time. And, you know, they say May, but who knows? It could be June. So I guess, in a way, that's kind of what CES is all about. Promises, 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 promises. Many of which won't be, uh, won't materialize till end of the year or even never. For instance, TVs, that's maybe one good reason if you could go to Vegas and, uh, and, and see these, it'd be maybe worth doing that because you can't see what a good, what the new TVs look like unless you see them in person. And at least at this time of year, you can't see them at all unless you see them at a trade show because they're not on the store shelves yet. We did get some relief from the confusion of 4K. There is now a standard UHD premium. Look for the, look for the UHD premium seal on uh, future products, not just your TV, but your Blu-ray player. Your discs themselves, Hollywood says, we'll have as many as 100 movies by the end of the year. Mostly movies you don't want to watch. But we'll have them by the end of the year in this new format, UHD Premium, which includes more than just ultra high def or 4K. It includes high dynamic range. That was the buzzword this year. HDR. If you've listened to the show and you've heard our uh, home theater guru, Scott Wilkinson, talk, you know about HDR. It's just... I, you know, bigger difference between the darks and the lights. It's more realistic. Better color reproduction, according to this standard. And if a set's to meet this standard, it has to, you know, have 90% of the color gamut possible and so forth. All technical stuff, which one hopes means it'll be a better looking TV, because isn't that all that matters? But you won't know until you, you can see it. So you have to trust the tech pundits who saw them to, at CES this week. It's, yes, they look better, says Scott Wilkinson. Good. All right. Still can't buy it. You will. Someday. <laughs> someday. What else? Uh, Segway, the company that kind of created years ago now, more than 10 years ago, you know, the, the rolling scooter, the electric scooter, the self-balancing scooter. Uh, they they uh, decided that the hoverboard business was taking their money and they needed to get in that business. So they created a new mini Segway that uh, is basically uh, a Segway without a handle, which is kind of like the hoverboards, but it has inflatable tires, not hard rubber tires. And it has kind of a, a pole that <laughs> sticks up the middle and you you can steer with your calves. <laughs> oh, and just in case that's not enough. It'll turn into a robot with a additional optional accessories sold separately. What? I can't think of anything else. Okay, we're going to leave it at that. That's CES. See, aren't you glad? I covered it. I did it. It's done. Uh, hey, you know, now we've, uh, we did learn something this week, that T-Mobile is as bad as every other mobile carrier. See, we thought they were going to be the good guys. John Ledger, their CEO, outspoken. Turns out he's the Donald Trump of mobile carrier CEOs. He, he swore up a blue streak on a YouTube video saying, who is this EFF? And why are, th why are they lying about T-Mobile? Well, it turns out they're not lying, John. <laughs> T-Mobile, uh, which announced its binge on thing. Oh, this is a, see, if you don't dig deeper, this sounds like a good thing. If you just, on, and that's what John is hoping. And he's hoping by a lot of bluster and swearing that he'll convince people of the of, of the decency of his position instead of the facts. So what? What? So let me just tell you what T-Mobile's doing. This binge on thing, which follows on their music binge on, they don't call it that, means that it doesn't count against your data caps if you watch certain streaming video, just as it didn't count against your data caps if you listen to Pandora or Spotify or Apple Music or Google Music, you know, some of the music things. That's nice because you're in your car and you're listening to music and it's not counting against your data. You don't have to pay for it. That's great. Uh, with as, as regards to video, you know, and both of these are kind of, they call them zero rating, which is not a very clear term. What it means is that certain privileged parties get this treatment, but the rest of us don't. And what that means is that T-Mobile gets to pick winners and losers. For instance, YouTube is not zero rated. So if you watch YouTube on your T-Mobile phone, it counts against your data cap. 
counts and it costs you money. But if you watch Netflix, it doesn't. So isn't that T-Mobile kind of picking a winner? Kind of is. But worse than that, turns out binge on, all binge on does, they use the word optimize. It's not optimizing. It's throttling. That what T-Mobile's doing, if you turn on binge on, and by the way, if you have a T-Mobile account, it's on unless you turn it off. It's on by default. Is it takes every bit of video and slows it down <laughs> to a megabit and a half a second. Regardless of <laughs> whether they're binge on participants or not. Which means many video streams will start looking terrible or stuttering. Or buffering. Oh, no. Ledger says, that's not throttling. That's throttling, John. That is. It's throttling. They even admit it. 8888-ASK Leo. Hey, let's talk high tech. But, you know, your, your stuff right now, right after this. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. But at least Karma says it's throttling, right? No, they're not re-encoding it. They're not optimizing it. They're just throttling it. <laughs> That's the funniest thing. They say optimizing. What they're doing is saying, no, you can't go over a megabit and a half. So uh, Twit, for instance, if you're watching a stream that isn't... Now, most video providers, including uh, Ustream, one of our video providers, will notice that you're down a megabit and a half and will, down, and will give you a lower quality stream. So that they can keep up. And so T-Mobile's kind of hoping that Netflix does that and others will just automatically, well, we only got a megabit and a half on this stream, so let's give them a 480p or thereabouts quality picture or whatever. Let's downgrade. And some of our providers will do that, but not all. So um, in which case, all you get is stuttering and buffering. So they're not optimized. They're not changing the signal in any way. They're just saying, all they're saying is megabit and a half. Megabit and a half. Well, the Oculus did not announce a price. They just said it'll cost you about fifteen hundred dollars with a PC. So we assumed it'd be five hundred bucks, but they never set a price. So five ninety nine. Whatever. What evs? Yeah, there's the EFF article. But what made me mad about Ledger is he, but he thought by blustering and calling it BS and saying. Oh, who is this EFF? And it's not throttling, you know, just by shouting, by saying the kind of the Donald Trump method, just by saying it loudly, that would be sufficient. And it's just a big lie. And I really had, ex had, had hoped for and expected for more from T-Mobile. I'm a T-Mobile customer. Well, I'm also an AT&T customer and a Sprint customer. But I finally got rid of my Verizon. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888, ask Leo. Back from her visit to the Yucatan Peninsula. No, where where did you go again? Cabo San Lucas? <laughs> Cancun. Cancun. That's on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. You're on the West Coast. You could just go straight south and, and, and hit ah, Mexico. Don't get me started. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> no, Cancun's beautiful. So did you have a nice vacation? Yeah. Were you there for Christmas? No, no. Just no, New no. Year's? No, no, just a week. Just after New Year. Yeah. All right. But, ooh, that white, white sand and that teal, teal water. Oh, it's beautiful. The Caribbean, right? Oh, it's incredible. Yeah, it's beautiful. We were in the Bahamas. It's beautiful. He said, well, I don't know why the water's so blue there, but it is. And it's just, it's so clear. And then you it's sail. Like snow. We sailed out of New Jersey, so it's kind of fun because you're sailing back from the Bahamas, which is kind of blue water, and then it turns kind of a different Murky. color. <laughs> <laughs> Greenish. <laughs> ah, Jersey. Uh, Jersey. No, I love New Jersey. Jersey. That's where my family's from. So uh, you have been lining them up, I see. Mm -hmm. So I can knock them down. People are dying to talk to you again. Who? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm out of the doghouse now, aren't I? So who should I uh, talk to? Well, let's stay on the East Coast, shall we? Yeah. Dave in Binghamton. Oh, Binghamton. That's in New York. Home of the State University of New York. Hello, David. Hey, how are you? I'm well. How are you? Not too bad. And as a Bengals fan, I can't imagine what I can't believe what happened yesterday. Oh my golly, that was some uh, that was some ending, wasn't it? That it was. Yeah, you know, hearing on hold to talk about it. <laughs> not happy. But also, we I pretend know, during these shows that nothing is going on in the rest of the world. <laughs> 
Nothing Correct, else yeah. is happening. It's just you yeah. and me and the tech community. And everyone in uh, uh, the live chat. I'm pretty lucky to on there. They're great, aren't they? So have you talked to them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every so often I still am in the live chat. Great. Yeah, we, we uh, I don't know if everybody knows that, but we have a uh, chat room going. I have, since I started uh, doing this in the early 90s, had an IRC chat room going in the background. And I always call them kind of the kids in the back of the class, kind of the wiseacres. But every once in a while, like almost every question, they'll come up with good suggestions. So I like to have that's them. There. Yeah, that's so, they definitely do. What can I do um, for you? My question, uh, yeah, my question is in regard to Apple Mail. Um, I bought a used uh, Mac Mini i5 mid 2011, and uh, it's the base um, four gigs for the uh, yeah. for the RAM. Yeah. And so now my Apple Ma I transferred all my mail from my old computer, and I thought I should really go through it because I have about 100,000 messages just yeah. still in there, yeah. um, kind of my own my own little server. But right now, um, or constantly, it's either downloading messages or moving messages. And it just, just like right <laughs> well, now, you did. You did kind of. You can't really blame it. You lo <laughs> you kind of loaded it up there. Hundred thousand <laughs> old messages. That's <laughs> an old. By the way, this is kind of an old-fashioned way of handling mail. True. The idea of storing it locally. Yeah, I don't like the IMAP um, storing out server or even the pop storing out server. I like having okay. it on mine and my backup and. Okay. Yeah, but you see, the uh, the uh, drawback to it is it's it's taking a lot of processing yeah well it's like on my old uh my old laptop is a 20 or 2006 and when i had to back or re reload it and use it again it went through very quickly and no problems yeah uh, this new one probably is, some of it is because what you're using a newer version of the operating system so it's converting the form mail apple has now several times kind of changed how mail works Right. And when it does that, it has to go back through the database of existing messages and and re-index it and uh, and in some cases modify it, and it's not good. Uh, it's uh, it's the argument against, frankly, using a proprietary format for storing mail. You know, the there's an old-fashioned way of doing it. They call it the MBOX format. Thunderbird uses it, where it's plain text files, and uh, it tends. I think it tends to be a little more robust. And if you lose a message, you don't, you know, you're not, you lose a message, you don't lose the whole blob. I'm not right. sure what Apple Mail is uh, doing. Are, what, what operating, what version of OS X are you using? El Capitan. El Capitan, the latest. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when, you know, when they did, when they changed, uh, when they came out with El Capitan, they changed the file format again in uh, Apple Mail. So I don't, uh, you know, I don't know what to say. Um, how long has it been going on? I uh, got this about three, four weeks ago. Oh, that's too um, long. No, something's wrong. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, one thing you can do, uh, one thing you can do is uh, is force a re-index on Apple Mail. So now this used to work. I don't know if it still does. Let me look it up on El Capitan. But you used to be able to hold down the Option key when you la uh, launched Apple Mail, and it would rebuild the index. Right. Yeah, I think there's an option in one of the drop-down menus as well. Yeah. Uh, um, so that, yeah, it's in the menus now. That would be a good idea. Uh, did you try that? I think I did once, um, but I could try that again. Shouldn't take four weeks. <laughs> Shouldn't take Definitely. four weeks. Would hope not. You can go in a little deeper and delete index files and things like that. You have to be careful here. You don't want to delete the mail itself. Right. Um, but there is a mail data fo folder, and it has uh, something called an envelope index file. That could be the problem, too. See, what it is is, and this is why nowadays most people don't want to store their mail locally, especially if they have 100,000 messages. I understand your rationale, and certainly for privacy and other reasons you might want to do this. But you you now have a giant database, and these programs are, are using, it's like it is a database, of mail and it has to index it, it has to format it, it has to do all sorts of processing to it. And if it gets munged up, which it sounds like it has been, because it shouldn't take, you're right, it shouldn't take four weeks, maybe a day, you know, or a few hours. So right. I'm, I'm a little nervous about what's going on here. 
Um, and that's why, you know, ever since Gmail came out more than 10 years ago, we just say, okay, you Google, you keep my mail and I'll use Google's very fast searching algorithms to search through it. And Gmail seems to do a good job of not corrupting the mailboxes. But somebody else has your mail on their servers. Some people don't like that idea. So you're, you, you, are now, uh, <laughs> you are now experiencing the fun and profit of having your own giant mail database. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I'll I'll put in the show notes at uh, techilabs.com. Uh, there's a I'm looking at a Computer World article from last year, how to fix. You could Google it too. How to fix Apple Mail by rebuilding and reindexing the mailbox, and it has the standard menu command, but it has some deeper commands as well. I'll look for that. Yeah, cool. Uh, it's you know, the problem is that Apple doesn't reveal a lot about what it's how it's doing, what it's doing, and what changes it made, and so forth. So we don't, we can't, it's hard to know. That's why I like a standard, like the Unix for, uh, mailbox format, inbox, because everybody knows how it works and you can, there's lots of tools out there to play with it, mess with it. Yeah, the whole keep it simple. Yeah, keep okay. it simple. <laughs> yeah. So all I can, you know, I don't, I don't have an answer for you, but I'll give you, you know, take a look at that article, try rebuilding it. That's, it, we've all seen this with databases, a giant, the bigger it gets, the, and this is just, you know, you just got to have to kind of, mess around with it keep a copy of that mail uh, folder somewhere else so if you mess it up you can you can restore it that would be my advice leo laporte the tech guy our show today brought to you by squarespace i love squarespace have you seen my new website on squarespace i finally you know after all this time moved my uh, leoville.com my personal page to Squarespace, and I'm kicking myself for not doing this sooner. Squarespace is the easiest, best way to create a website, whether it's a blog, a portfolio, your resume. They have a cover page feature that is so great. That's what I. That's what first attracted me. In fact, the first thing you see if you go to leoville.com, I'll load it up, is the Squarespace cover page feature, which is basically a slideshow. Of, in my case, a slideshow of you know. Full screen pictures. Now, the beauty of this, as with every Squarespace site, is it's mobile responsive. So I'm watching this on a big screen. It uses up all the screen, but I can resize it. And it automatically reformats for any size screen, which means it works great on a mobile phone, on a, on a giant display. And you see below, I have links to my Facebook, to my Twitter. That's the other thing that Squarespace does so well. It links to all your other stuff including my uh, PGP keys. I have an about page. It, and this all was done pretty automatically. Archives, I imported all my archives going back to 2001 of my blog, which is awesome. My blog is now there. I have a photo album there. This is all basic functionality built into Squarespace. Made it, I did not have to do any. Now, if you, really, if you like to tweak with it, you can. Squarespace uh, will give you hundreds of settings, fonts, colors, page configurations based on their fundamental templates. And by the way, these templates are state-of-the-art stuff. And this is what you would pay a company a lot of money to create, is these beautiful templates. They have commerce built in. Yes, they have responsive built in. Um, the, when I, I almost hate to use the word template because... It's, it, it sounds like, oh, well, I'm going to look like one of 25 possibilities. No, you start with the template, but each one gives you the complete control that you need to make it yours and uniquely. So I just at random picked a uh, template called Aubrey, beautiful template. But then look at these are all different websites, and you can do this at squarespace.com using Aubrey. Each of them looks unique. Here's a restaurant called the Supper Club using Delta Supper Club using Aubrey. And you can learn more about the about the supper club. You can become a member. It's this is just super sweet. By the way, when you sign up for a year, which is the most economical way to do this, you're going to get your own domain name, so you can have a supper club or whatever it is you want to do. This would be great for a newborn baby. What a great gift to set up a Squarespace site and then give it to the parents. This is the best place to make a website. As I said, e-commerce. Yep, built in. It's the only platform that lets you. Uh, Brand your store in a beautiful way, not some, you know, shopping cart. Great 24-7 customer support. If you're a musician, if you have a band or you have gigs, they have templates for that with uh, with concert schedules and where you can buy uh, music. And all of this is built in. 
and, it, and the price is right. I want you to try it. Squarespace.com. It's free to try. And I do ask one thing. If you decide to buy, you use the offer code TECHGUY. That way you'll get 10% off your first purchase. And that could save you a lot of money. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. I did. John is in Biddeford. Biddeford, Minnesota? Biddeford, Maine. 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 That's, uh, Maine. We gotta, we gotta teach. We gotta teach. Uh, <laughs> oh, Heather, it's not your fault. We gotta teach Heather the state two-letter state abbreviations. M E is Maine, right? That's correct. Yes. M N is Minnesota. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, uh, she wants me to get right to the point. So I'll. Yeah, like Leo does, right? Right to the point, Leo. Anyway, I happen to be running a version of Windows 8 Pro yeah. on a laptop yeah. that I got when I was in school a couple of years ago. Uh, are you familiar with the Microsoft program that allows uh, students in the, you know, in, in, in a community college or university to get free copies of certain Microsoft software? Absolutely. It's a great program, yeah. So anyway, uh, uh, the Windows 8 Pro is now on the laptop, and unlike everybody else who's been bombarded by these messages to install Windows 10. Yeah, you're getting that one too. Yeah. Yeah. I am getting no such messages. I would like to install Windows 10. Oh. I'm afraid to do so because, um, you know, I haven't got any, I don't have that Microsoft emblem in the tray or anything like that. Yeah, that's important. Uh, um, so my advice has always been, and by the way, Windows 10 came out in July, July 29th. So it's been out for a while now, almost six months. Uh, and, of course, everybody who has Windows 7 and 8, an authenticated version of Windows 7 and 8 on their system, supposedly can upgrade for free. Uh, and that's where that little pop-up is that says, hey, you know, it could be free. Would you like it? And it's annoying. You have the opposite problem. You've never seen it. Generally, in the past, I've said that means Microsoft has not determined your system's compatible. I'm not sure that's the case here because it's been a long time. Is that the student edition of Windows that you have on there? No. Well, all I know is it's uh, Windows 8 Pro, which cannot be upgraded to Windows 8.1. Oh, oh, okay. Um, I get it. I get it. I get it. But I did look at the uh, list of, there's a small list of Windows 8 versions that cannot be upgraded to 10, and this is not among them. Okay. So there is a Windows 10 compatibility checker, a program that you should run. Uh, this is in lieu of getting that pop-up. And then I'll tell you how you can upgrade manually. But I do want you to run the compatibility checker first. Okay, how do I get to that? Uh, you could just Google Windows 10 compatibility checker. You'll find a, a place to download it. Um, and uh, if, if it is compatible, then there's a simple process of downloading the ISO and installing it. And because you have an eligible copy of Windows 8, that is already authenticated. Do make sure it's authenticated, uh, but as long as it's authenticated, and I'll say that in the About Windows uh, window. Okay. Um, then it will just automatically install Windows 10 and uh, and authenticate, and you won't have to do. There's no, you know, entering a serial number or anything like that. So um, you definitely want. Pretty, you, I'm, I'm sorry. It should be a pretty simple process then. Yeah, yeah, but you want to run that because in my past experience, if you didn't see that advertisement and let's face it that's what it is for windows 10 that meant that microsoft didn't deem your system ready yet uh that there was some compatibility issue uh, so i would i would make sure that you know run the compatibility make checker make sure you're compatible and if you are then you can download the windows 10 what they call iso which is basically um we don't you know they don't distribute discs i guess you could if you really wanted to buy a disc but uh, for free, they don't distribute disks. They just distribute an image, a disk image, which is called an ISO, that you download and you can install. And they'll give you instructions for how to do that. And that should be fairly painless. But that's the issue. Well, I want to make sure that you're compatible because if you're not, there'll be issues involved. Incidentally, yeah. the, I'm not sure if the ISO, I believe the current Windows 10 ISO is updated to what we call Threshold 2, which is the, that was a big update that came out in... Uh, December or November. Um, right, I'm aware of that. And you want that because that that made a big difference. If you just Google Windows 10 ISO, you'll see, you'll go right to the page that says download Windows 10 disk image. Okay. 
Well, that was a question of mine because uh, if I have to run the compatibility checker and download the ISO, you're telling me I'm not going to get the threshold. I have to install it. and, and uh, No, you are, in fact, because I'm just checking, and I believe this is threshold on the ISO. It took him a while to make that happen. In any event, after you install it, you do definitely want to run the update and continue to run the update to make sure everything works fully. Okay, well, uh, I, I'll give it a try, and uh, let's hope uh, it works, because I do not want to keep Windows 8 on this machine no. any longer than I have to. Yeah, 10 is so much better. It's highly recommended. But lots of weird little bugs, and that's one of the reasons I, I mentioned this threshold update, this threshold to update, because you really do want to get the latest version of Windows. So that's important to run that update until it's done, and there's nothing more. It says, your system is completely up to date. My experience, that makes a big difference in, in uh, reliability. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. That. Yeah, we had a caller, last caller of the show yesterday, uh, and I didn't have time to really give it the full answer. And after I did some research, um, the, the, our caller said, she said, uh, my start, I hit the start menu on Windows 10, nothing comes up. I hit the Windows key on Windows 10, nothing comes up. I'm not getting the start menu. And at first I thought, well, this must be a mouse issue. But the chat room helped me, and I uh, did some research. And in fact, this is not an uncommon problem with Windows 10 and appears to be fixed by the update, the 1511 update that came out in November, December. So, uh, so, and then somebody in the chat room is saying, if you have Windows 8.0, which he did, the Windows 8.0 version, you're going to want to go to 8.1 <laughs> uh, anyway. Right, because uh, even if you didn't go to Windows 10, because they're going to stop supporting Windows 8.1, uh, 8.0, I should say, after January 12th. Yeah, like in a few days. <laughs> oh, lordy, lordy. That just means, that doesn't mean what it sounds like. It's not like the end of the world, but it would be a good idea to go to 8.1 if you haven't gone to 8.1, at, at least, if not to 10. Kenny in Temple, Texas, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Kenny. Hello, how are you doing? I'm well, how are you? I'm doing good. Um, my question is, uh, I'd like to know how to export my points of interest in Google Maps. So not the ones you've personally created or the ones that are already built in? The ones that, you know, you search for something and go somewhere and then it goes ahead, you know, it saves it, I guess, as a history or... The next time you go to directions, it you know it remembers stuff. those. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, I'm not specifically sure about that, but what you should do is go to Google.com/dashboard. Google.com/dashboard. That's your Google dashboard. If you're logged into your Google account, uh, and it, it will make sure you are logged in, you will see a dashboard of all of the things you have done on Google, including that those those location points that you've searched for. And then there's a thing called Google Takeout that will let you export those. Now, you're going to export them in a format probably uh, called XML that you may or may not be able to use. But uh, why do you want to export to, uh, them? What do you want to do with them? I wanted to use them in another uh, GPS program. Yeah, you know, most GPS programs will handle KML files. If you can get it out in a KML file, you might be able to. But there is location history. There's all sorts of information in here. That it's a good idea for anybody who has a Google account to check out this dashboard. This is what Google knows about you. And, um, and it's always useful <laughs> to know. And then Google has a policy that anything that's yours, you should be able to take out. You should be able to get. And that's what they call Google Takeout. And that really is an export. And what you can do when you go to Google Takeout is say, I want to take this out and not that. And you could just check just the box for, um, for your map data. I'm not sure exactly what data you're going to get. And I, as I said, I'm not sure exactly what format it will be, but it should give you some information about that. So google.com slash dashboard to see what it knows. Uh, google.com slash takeout to get it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's see here. Here's the takeout. Do, 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 do. So you'd want to uncheck everything, select none, and then go and look. Location history. Oh, it's a JSON file. Now I wonder. Oh, look. You can get it as a KML. Okay. So that's what you want to do. 
KML is a standard map format that uh, every every location program should be able to handle. So um, go to google.com slash takeout, go down to, lo I think, location history. Oh, the other one that you might want, actually, let's check this one, too, is maps your places. That's in JSON, unfortunately. They don't seem to give you a KML version of that. Um, but those are the two things you might want. I'm not, I'm, I'm not exactly sure which data you want. You may not care about location history. That's everywhere you've been. You may only care about places you've created. I'm not sure what you mean. But um, the problem with this is this GeoJSON format. You might have to find a converter that will take it out of JSON. Well, that will be my advice. Yep, yep, yep. yep. I, I like it that Google not only will uh, expose what they know about you in the dashboard, but uh, will give you a chance to export it and use it somewhere else if you wish. You got a question? Yeah, we've been discussing net neutrality. Oh, boy. There's a question. Yeah, so just, just, Do you want to know what it is? Yeah, yeah. Just go over uh, what you usually <laughs> say. I think that they intentionally come up with names for this stuff that are obfuscating, like net neutrality and that and zero rating, which really, that's what the heck is that? But the telecom industry loves, uh, you know, kind of bogus terminology. Net neutrality is really simple. There should be no discrimination against anybody on the Internet. All bits are created equal. And that's why net neutrality is a terrible phrase. It's like what we really should be is against discrimination on the Internet, that all any service provider on the Internet should have equal access to every customer. But a lot of the Internet service providers don't want it that way. They want to say, well, we don't really want you to use Skype because we have our own phone service, or we don't want you to use Netflix. Oh, that's, that's a good question, actually. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. A couple of lines open right now. That's unusual. 8888-ASK-LEO, 888-827-5536. Heather Hammond says, our phone ranger says, oh, that's because everybody's stuff's just working, and nobody needs you anymore, Leo. You can go home now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 8888 Ask Leo. Maybe they maybe I just haven't said the numbers slow enough lately. Andrea and George are visiting us in studio. We have an open studio. We like to have a studio audience. And Andrea uh, said, I would I have a question. What is this net neutrality on of which you harp, on which you harp all the time? It's a big deal, I think, net neutrality, but it's a terrible term describing it. And I don't think it's a complicated concept. But the words net neutrality obscure its meaning, and I think that's part of the problem. It's really very simple. Anybody who creates content on the Internet should have equal and fair access to everybody else who's on the Internet. If you're a website, or like me, a podcaster, I should be able to reach anybody who has an Internet access equally without throttling, without being slowed down, without favor or discrimination. And that's the neutrality part. And that's how the Internet was created, the idea that everybody should have equal access on the Internet. That's what makes the Internet so amazing, is that anybody can create a website. Anybody can create a YouTube video or, you know, write a song and put it on SoundCloud. And everybody who subscribes to the Internet, whether you pay, you know, $5 for an inexpensive dial-up line or $500 for a super high-speed line, should have access to your content. The problem is the people who uh, provide internet service, the internet service providers, often have commercial interests that are at a, opposed to this. So the, you know, the, the simple and easy one that I think anybody can understand is that if you are a big cable company in the business of providing internet service, say a Comcast or a Cox or a Time Warner, you, you, you know, in theory, when, when somebody pays you for Internet access, you should give fair and equal access to every website, everything out there. But, you know, Netflix kind of is competing with you, isn't it? Because instead of buying the premium Comcast cable TV service, I might just buy their Internet service and then eight bucks a month and watch Netflix all the time. So for business reasons, cable companies are incented, really, to discriminate against businesses that are in, in the same business, like 
Netflix, or Skype, which offers free phone calls. If you're a phone company, you may not like that. And it, I don't think there's a lot of examples. There's certainly aren't any clear examples of the United States of in the United States of companies wielding their market power to prevent that, you know, or to, to discriminate against competitors. But in other countries, Canada is a good example. Rogers, which is a big cable company in Canada, also a big internet service provider, doesn't make any bones about it. They they throttle Skype because they don't want you to be using Skype instead of their phone service. They don't like it. So it is, uh, you know, a, it was something that was a big, big debate in the U.S. The Federal Communications Commission finally decided that they were going to promulgate rules, regulations, that will, uh, that, that make it illegal to discriminate against content on the Internet. We'll see, though, how well they enforce those. So far, so good. But, but it does come up with uh, telecom, uh, you know, uh, wireless providers, companies like Verizon and Sprint and AT&T and T-Mobile. And they're doing a kind of an interesting thing, which customers like. It's called zero rating. And that's, by the way, another bad <laughs> name for something that is a very simple concept. And I'll use T-Mobile's binge on as an example. T-Mobile says, it kind of seems like the opposite of discrimination. We will favor some companies. We won't charge you when you visit or listen to music on Pandora. We won't charge you when you watch video on Netflix. And customers like that. Hey, I like that. That's what's wrong with that. It's free. Well, the problem is it's kind of reverse discrimination. It's favoring some companies, which means others are in disfavor. So it is, I think, a violation of net neutrality. It is a form of discrimination, kind of a positive form of discrimination, not negative discrimination. Instead of slowing other companies down, it, it doesn't charge you for some companies. But it puts them in the position of deciding winners and losers on the Internet. That's what we don't want. We want the Internet to be an even, equal, fair playing field. Because what if there's the next Netflix that's better and only charges $2 and has all the movies? And they come along and they... And T-Mobile, for one reason or another, says, yeah, we're not going to do that with them. Well, people are going to watch Netflix, and that's going to make it very hard for a competitor to arise and make a better service. So it's not in our interest as consumers for companies like AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and T-Mobile to discriminate. Even by discriminating by favoring certain companies. Does that make sense? Yeah. We don't want them to do it. Everybody should be treated equal on the Internet. That's because it's such a powerful tool for innovation, for competition, for invention. And it's in our interest as a society, as a country, and as people to foster that kind of exciting competition and innovation. Because who knows what the next big thing will be? And it's almost certain, even if uh, you know it's this kind of positive discrimination, that the next thing won't have the same favored treatment as the existing thing. You don't want to favor incumbents just because they're incumbents. You want to favor, you, you might even want to go the other way and favor innovation. That might be a good thing. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number. Jeremy, Studio City, you're next. Hi, Jeremy. Hi, good morning. I am uh, calling uh, with my son on the other line here because this is for him. He's got a PC. Okay. And, uh, you know, he watches PewDiePie and, and the people that do... Of course he like does, people. doesn't he? Yeah. What's your son's name? Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. Hi. And Jeremy is uh, into Minecraft, or what is he into? Minecraft, Call of Duty 3, and a lot of this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. I got it. Well, how can I help you, Dad? Yeah, well, so I'm trying to find a decent program for him to do the the, the video recording of the, the game while ah, he's playing, like yes. PewDiePie does. Yeah. So uh, PewDiePie uses some software that's very commonly uh, used by gamers. Uh, you do it on a PC. Are you a PC gamer? Yes. Okay, good. Because uh, it's a little harder to do it on a console like an Xbox or a PlayStation. But you could do it on a PC. Uh, and I wanted to mention, and this might be the thing to kind of wait for and get, a company called Razer, which makes gaming stuff, R-A-Z-E-R, -E they're at RazerZone.com, announced at CES a new camera called the Stargazer that works with existing software, and it does the things that, you, that would make you look better than PewDiePie. For instance, sometimes you see PewDiePie, they, you see the game, but PewDiePie's in a little square box in the corner, 
the Stargazer will let you be in the game. It, it takes the background out, and it's just you in the game. Uh, this is a very exciting uh, webcam designed specifically for gamers to do what PewDiePie does. Now, I want to warn you, you're not going to make a million dollars. So you, <laughs> you might, this is, a, this is going to be, I think, a couple of hundred bucks. It's not going to be cheap, but boy, this is going to be the standard. And it works with all of the software that people uh, use to do this. We'll put a link to this camera. It's not going to be available for a couple of months. And the software you need in the show notes, techguylabs.com. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. This is an awesome camera, which I will buy immediately. But uh, it is going to be, I think, 200 299 something like that. And then the software really varies. What is the there's free software that everybody uses. What do they call it? They call it uh, let's play software. What what do you mean I didn't answer the kid's question? <laughs> he needs a camera and he needs software. And there's a lot of different uh, game recorders. Fraps is the one I was thinking of. Everybody uses Fraps. But um, some games have it built in. It's kind of a more complicated solution. Yeah, he ran a record. Yeah. OBS. Everybody uses OBS now. Our show today brought to you by Epson printers. We love these EcoTank printers. We just got one at home, the 4550. I uh, put the ink in. It's got the ink tank on the side, and it prints. This 4550 will print 85, up to 8,500 color pages. That means I'm I'm not going to have to put more ink in, probably for a couple of years. And uh, when I do, and I love this, it's going to be low cost ink in bottles. This is a massive sea change in the way inkjet printing works, and Epson is the leader as usual. These printers, by the way, are great printers. There's a whole range of EcoTank printers, all of them using this new precision core technology. Epson introduced this on the show a couple of uh, months ago, maybe a year ago. The precision core technology does 40 million drops of ink a second. So you get ultra crisp black and white printing, and it's fast, just a few seconds per page. You get auto two-sided printing, 30-page auto document feeder. And because it's inkjet, it, there's no startup time. There's no warm-up time. It really is. It's the printer for your home or for your office. And now, with the EcoTank, you never have to interrupt a job because you've run out of ink and run out to the store and buy another cartridge. You don't have to. What an unbeatable combination. Convenience and value. And, by the way, you will save money for years to come because of those low-cost replacement ink bottles. Just love Epson. Just love Epson. For heavy-duty printing and work groups or for your home office, I that's what we've got. We've got the Ecotank 4550. You're going to love it. But they, they do have the big heavy-duty printers, too. They can do 20,000 pages without a refill. Love it. You can learn more if you go to the website Epson, E-P-S-O-N, Epson.com slash Ecotank. Epson Ecotank printers loaded and ready to print for up to two years with the ink in the box. Boom. Boom. It was kind of satisfying setting it up. <laughs> it was awesome. It was so much fun. Epson.com slash Ecotank uh, to learn more. And we do thank Epson so much for their support of the Tech Guy podcast. Epson.com slash Ecotank. Epson, exceed your vision. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the Tech Guy. Time to talk computers and the internet and home theater and digital photography and smartphones, smart watches, all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's my phone number. 888-827-5536. That's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, you can still call. Just use Skype. And it shouldn't cost you anything because it's a toll free number. 888-827-5536. Should mention the website. That's a very uh, handy thing for you to know about. TechGuyLabs.com. If you you know if you're driving, if you're busy, you don't have to write anything down because every page I mention and plus much more than I even mentioned, we put up there as a reference. 
And you can go day by day. You can go hour by hour. You can even go question by question. And you can add your comments, too. And I hope you'll do that if you have a better idea, suggestion. For instance, I was asking in the chat room what software PewDiePie uses to make his Let's Play videos on YouTube. You remember we had a caller, Jeremy, ended the hour last hour. And his 10-year-old wants to, as every 10-year-old does, by the way, nowadays, make YouTube videos. That's every single one does. Now, and I wonder, and I hope this is not the case, but I wonder if it's because they see that PewDiePie made $7 million last year. And I hope that that's not the reason they want to do it. Because, first of all, there is only one PewDiePie. And second, I don't think all of that money comes from YouTube. I think almost all of the top YouTube earners make money in additional ways. I feel like YouTube miss, is... I don't feel... <laughs> How do I say this? If you if you're a, if you work on if you put videos on YouTube, it's basically a feudal system. You're a serf laboring in the fields of Google, and you give them your stuff, and they deign to give you a little a rutabaga. Thank you, thank you for harvesting those forty three acres. Here's a rutabaga. Basically, that's how it works. And that's only if they feel like it. Google doesn't tell you how much they charge for the advertising or how much you get of what they charge. They don't tell you. They just say, here's a rutabaga and be glad. And what they've done, of course, is they've mentioned the top 20 earners who've made a million rutabagas. But that's not what you're going to get. In fact... It's not even what you're going to get if you have a million views. So first of all, if, if you're making videos on YouTube and you're putting those videos up, you're going to get a few hundred, maybe a few thousand views. You're not going to make anything. But even if you get a million views, and by the way, that's very hard to do. You have to make great content. And, and when I say great, it may not be great in my point of view. I, PewDiePie, I can't watch for more than a minute. But somebody loves PewDiePie. <laughs> somebody loves this guy. He's a Swedish guy uh, who makes these videos. They tend to be what's called Let's Play videos. He plays a game. You watch him while he plays the game. Uh, swears a lot. Swears up a blue streak. Uh, and I think if you're 10 years old, you think that's pretty funny. <laughs> I think that's really the basic premise here. That's funny. He said the bad word. Uh, and most of these videos, and I've watched a lot of them because I have a 13-year-old at home, and that's all he watches. By the way, he doesn't watch TV. He doesn't watch movies. He plays video games and watches YouTube of other people playing video games. That's pretty much 99% of his uh, content that he consumes. And that's not at all atypical. And that's why somebody like PewDiePie can get millions and millions of views. Then YouTube puts some ads on there. And they give PewDiePie some amount of money. Maybe you've got the magic touch. Maybe you are the next PewDiePie. And I, I'm sure there is. But it's kind of like saying maybe you're the next Shaquille O'Neal. Or maybe you're the next LeBron James. Or the next Barry Bonds. Or the next Joe Montana. It's um, you're, you're probably more likely to win the Powerball lottery, I'll be honest with you. In fact, frankly, if I were... Uh, trying to make some money i'd buy a powerball ticket that's you know one chance in 250 million that's pretty good compared i think your chances of becoming the next pewdiepie are are slimmer now you may say well but i have control of that yeah maybe maybe you're going to make maybe you've got that magic ticket i don't know but it's a lot of work most of the people 99.99 percent of the people who put videos on youtube make nothing and work very hard and even if you get a million views you might make a few hundred dollars i mean i'm not kidding it's not it's a rutabaga it's not it's not wealth and riches so do it because you like it do it because it's fun do it because your friends like it because you you're learning how to do video production well there are lots of reasons but don't do it to be the next beauty pie that ain't gonna happen bad news it's just not gonna happen and then there's maybe one person listening right now who is gonna be the next beauty pie Congratulations. I don't even think, frankly, five years from now, we'll even any of this will even exist. It'll be something else. So really, you shouldn't be aiming at what's hot now. You should be aiming at the next hotness five years from now. Better, You'd be better doing that. If you could figure out what that is. You know, I don't think PewDiePie, when he started, said, you know, the next big thing is going to be people watching me 
swear while I play a video game? I don't think so. I think he did it because uh, this is fun. Anyway, the software people use, and we've put this up on the website, uh, there's a variety of stuff. It was Fraps for a long time. If You need to be on a Windows machine. Apparently, everybody uses OBS now. I don't know what PewDiePie uses, but it's probably something like OBS. And, uh, you know, if you're making millions of dollars, you can afford to buy the latest, greatest technology, green screens and, and all sorts of stuff. But OBS works pretty well for a kid sitting in front of a PC. Dad can set it up. He can record. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are doing it live now on Twitch.tv. That's the next big thing. And there are people make money on Twitch.tv, but that, that's an interesting system because it's a patronage system pretty much. Um, it's not ad-supported so much as people in your chat room give you money. <laughs> and if you can create a, a base of uh, fans who give you a significant amount of money, it feels a little bit like a TV preacher. <laughs> I will play Call of Duty until you give me money. <laughs> But but it's kind of what's happening. Twitch.tv is the other place. And these these are called the category is called Let's Play for some reason. We're all playing. OBS is free, which is nice because it's open source. Uh, Fraps doesn't live stream, so you'd have to use OBS if you wanted to use Twitch. Um, and I don't know what the magic of it is, frankly. I and uh, and maybe uh, I probably come I'm coming off as a jealous old media guy saying well these kids that's not content you need to have blow-dried hair if you want to do good content maybe that's maybe that's probably what i sound like but uh i you know i i i, I would just warn people you probably have a better chance of becoming an nba star of winning the powerball than you do of being the next big youtube star it's tough and the people there was a good article in the new york times about people uh, the vast majority of successful people on youtube who are well known they don't make quite enough money to keep ends together so they have to have real jobs and they find it very hard because they get recognized all the time as they're waitressing or serving burgers at mcdonald's and it's embarrassing because people say oh, but what are you doing here you're a youtube star yeah well <laughs> you can't live on rutabagas 88 uh, 88 ask leo it's fun to watch it is fun to watch, I have to say. I understand that. And, uh, and you know, if you're into a game, if you're into League of Legends, which is very popular, for instance, on uh, Twitch, you can learn a lot about that game. I think that's one of the reasons Michael, um, my son, watches a lot of uh, YouTube. Is cause he, partly it's because he's learning how to play the game or new techniques. And then sometimes it's just because they say bad words really loud in sudden fashion. And he thinks that's hysterical. 80... 8888 88, ask Leo. That's the number. 888-827-5536. And I got into this whole discussion saying the website, techguylabs.com. That's your resource. And we'll put a link to all the different programs. It's quite a long list that people use to do Let's Play videos. More of your calls right after this. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. Back to the phones. Larry is in Ashland, Ohio. Hi, Larry. Hey, Leo. Hey. hey. First of all, th thanks for everything you do. Uh, I had uh, the pleasure a couple of years ago of visiting your Brickhouse studio and uh, was really impressed by your kind of multi-camera live streaming setup. And uh, I went back to the cooperative association that I'm a member of and said, we needed to do something like this for our annual conference for nice. our streaming. Nice. We did We did that. We we went out and got a Blackmagic ATEM uh, switcher. And Very cameras. fancy, yeah. Well, no, only a thousand bucks. I know, those ATEMs are amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. And uh, literally our viewership went up by a factor of 10 when we did that. Fantastic. It, it was just astonishing well now we're ready to bring it up to the next level yeah one thing we found was we've got people walking around the front of a room in a big presentation so we need a camera operator we can't just do fixed yeah, cameras you need to follow them around right yeah yep exactly and we need we have a we have spotlights and we had like black velvet drapes so we had some issues with exposure control and stuff like that too right so so we've ordered up the black magic uh, 4k cameras so we're going to upgrade the cameras but we need to have the person operating the switcher tell the camera operator what to do. Now, Blackmagic 
sell. <laughs> you know, it's fun. Like, all all the t professional TV people who are listening are hearing you reinvent television. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You need what we call talkback. You need a way to talk to the operator and say, uh, "Zoom in, square up, get get that yeah, right." Or I or don't, shoot don't, shoot shoot the sofa. Yeah. Yeah, don't move while I'm right. switching over to you or right. something like that. Well, they but also the need that, is, by the way, as long as you're going to do that, they also need a return so they can see what uh, you're seeing, they're seeing and what you're seeing. And it never ends. <laughs> it's getting more and more complicated. Yeah. Uh, you're you're well, reinventing television. Well, the problem is their talkback system on Black Magic is like more than everything we've spent so far. Right. So it's a little tough on the budget. We've been, you know, spending two or three grand a year and we're developing a pretty nice system. I'm just wondering, is there some other way out there kind of on the cheap to do this? Could we do some kind of – without the, the visual feedback to the yeah. camera operator, but could we just do some kind of like hook so, a couple of iPhones yeah. up? So you have to, yeah, exactly. So you have to think out of the box here. What you probably could do is make a conference call. And uh, and you need to do this. You need like a professional or, you know, there's free conference call dot com. There's a lot of sites that will do this where you can have everybody who's uh, uh, going to be doing this in one conference call. And then they all have their smartphones with an earpiece and they're in the conference call and your director is in the conference call. And he's saying now you're going to have to name them. You know, fancy talkback systems. You can speak individually to each camera. But in this case, you're going to say, hey, Joe. Hold on, we're gonna we're gonna shoot you, Joe. Okay, take Joe. Okay, now uh, ready, 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 Sally. Okay, take Sally. You're gonna have to do it like that because you don't, you know, you. But every because everybody's hearing everything. But a simple conference call would do absolutely. In fact, we've done that. Uh, when we, uh, for instance, we have a way of streaming oh, using the cell networks live from Las Vegas from CES to our studio, and that's all we'll do. We'll open up a cell uh, uh, a phone call. So and that's in real time, and we can talk to the camera operator. You can even talk to the host that way. We've done it that way as well. Mm. They just put an earbud in their ear, and uh, and now they have talkback. Wow, I think that's the way we'll go. Oh yeah, it's very simple, and everybody has a smartphone or any, oh, a cell phone of some kind. So, well, uh, it'd be cheaper to buy a cell phone than it would be. <laughs> to, uh, These talkback systems talk are expensive. Back. Yeah, yeah, and they're not really significantly better than than doing this. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of times that's what you do. Even with network television, when you're doing a remote and the host needs to talk to the talent, the talent might have an earpiece. Sometimes that's over a phone line. Often that's over a phone line hmm. because it's cheap and easy. So that's my suggestion. Okay, very good. Thanks again. You're very welcome. Don't whatever you do, don't go don't go down the road of teleprompters. Oh, you and tally lights. <laughs> Resist that with all your might. It's fun because what we've done, what we're doing really, uh, is using consumer-grade electronics to reinvent television broadcast. We're in the Mil Uncle Milty, the Milton Berle era of new media. And so we have to reinvent it, which is fun. And if you think out of the box, you can come up with a lot of interesting uh, solutions for that stuff. Clarence, Chesapeake, Virginia. Hi, Clarence. Leo Laporte. The hey, Tech. Leo. I'm hey, glad Clarence. you're back. Thanks. I'm glad to be back. I missed you guys. Okay. I stood out on the uh, fan tail of the boat and answered questions. But I, I've got my Motor X because of you. It, that Motor X is working terrifically. Fantastic. Glad to hear it. And so your Dave is still talking about that wine trip he took. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. Hey, Dave, uh, Leo, um, I'm a truck driver. Okay. And the autonomous trucks are being talked about a lot. And I know you've talked about the autonomous cars. Yes. But the autonomous trucks are coming. Wow, now that is long. fascinating to me. You mean like big rigs? Yeah, 80,000 80, pounds of freight moving down the highway and byway with no driver behind the wheel. None? Not even somebody in the cab? In the cab right now. Right now? Yeah. Are, is this happening right now? They're testing them right now. That's scary. Yep, and uh, some of the things that uh, That's really I have, scary. yeah, some of the things that I have in my truck because of all this new tech is the on guard system, which measures the vehicle in front of me. Isn't that great? I can see how I can see how fast he's going. It's basically I, radar, isn't it? It, it is radar. 
I can, uh, the truck on cruise will speed up and slow down up to the posted speed limit. Wow. Uh, so that's all part of that new integrated system Isn't they're coming out with. Wow. I have a manual transmission with an auto clutch. So you don't have to, uh, you have a manual no. transmission with an auto clutch. Yeah. So how, what is, is that like an automatic transition or no? What is, how does yeah, that work? Yeah, it, 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 basically it's an automatic transmission. And uh, I just have a paddle that I either go forward or reverse. What the what? <laughs> wow. And I, I uh, pushed the paddle forward for 12 years of forward speed. Uh, you don't have to double clutch and no, manhandle the stick and uh, grind no, the gears. All of that's gone, huh? Uh, I'll tell you what. This auto clutch is so smooth. There's no grinding of gears. It wow. everything is synchronized. Wow. It's amazing. who makes this? Is this a Mac? What who, who makes these well, trips? Freightliner. Freightliner. Uh, listen to this. When they did the unveil at the Hoover Dam, using the Hoover Dam as a screen <laughs> and using multi laser cameras wow. to project this onto uh, and the the Hoover Dam is not flat. Wow. It's not flat. No, it's a curved it's screen. It'd actually be a great IMAX screen. Uh, it, yeah, that's what they did. Uh, they, they, we live in, you know, isn't it weird? We really live in, in, in science fiction. We live in the future. Who was it said, who was it said the, the future's here already? It's just not evenly distributed. Hey, I, we're running out of time. I'm glad you called, Clarence. Here come the autonomous vehicles. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Chris Marquardt has the week off. He'll be back next week with more photographic tips and information for you. Uh, so let's get back to the phones. Mike in Grant Pass, Oregon. Hello, Mike. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Good, good. Hey, uh, Leo, I've got a Wi-Fi security question. Um, mm -hmm. I live in rural southwest Oregon, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I've heard you talk quite a bit about access to internet from rural areas. It's a shame Indicate. because you deserve good internet, but yeah, it's, it's not here. It's not economically viable for most of the current internet service providers. No, yeah. but I, I have two ways of accessing the internet. One is through a, a Verizon unlimited data mm -hmm. uh, account on my phone, which I actually use most of the time. Yeah. Um, but the other method is I have a, a point to point connection through a, through a firm up here that does, um, you know, they do point to point internet. And um, it's it's rather expensive, but my my security question is, they normally on the internet you you set your router to a DHCP connection, right? In this case here, uh, they require that we access their signal in a bridge mode. So, oh, that's interesting. So you're connecting to a router at the it's a wireless internet service provider. So you're connecting to a router at the home base that's that's doing dhcp can you use multiple computers with it well what i do is i have i'm using an apple uh, airport express so so obviously i can connect multiple computers to my apple you bridge to it and you let right. it do a dhcp and it will allow you to have many 10.0 or 10.1.1 addresses yeah i mean i can i okay. can have i can have five or six different connections in the house okay. with whatever i want through my airport express but i was just concerned about the bridge mode that's what i had to set the apple airport express in the bridge yeah mode. no so normally um we started using routers because an internet service provider would give us a single internet address and uh, if you're just connecting one computer you can connect it directly to them and that's fine but most people had multiple and as time's gone by we more and more of us have multiple devices that we want to connect to a single internet connection. So people started buying these routers, you know, the cheap Linksys routers or whatever. And the whole point of a router was it takes a single internet address and then allows multiple devices to use it using network address translation or NAT. And a DHCP is the configuration protocol that is in the router that says, okay, I'm going to give you a number, give you a number, give you a number. In other words, the computer doesn't have a pre-assigned internet address, IP address. It is given one from the router. So as soon as you turn on your laptop and it attaches to the router, 
the router says, all right, you are going to be, and there, and there are two ranges. It's either 192.168.1. something or 10.1.1. something. Those are, those are internal private uh, ranges. They're not public. And they can't, in fact, be routed. They're, they're private numbers. Mm -hmm. And then the router is routing. Incoming traffic, it says, okay, that one goes to computer one, that one goes to computer two, that one. It's, 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 it's doing traffic direction. So network address translation, dynamic host configuration protocol, and routing. Those are the things those boxes do. There's a side effect, which is the security part you're talking about. The router now is kind of an impenetrable barrier to the internal network. Any traffic coming from the outside world hits the router first, and the router's a dumb box. If, if the router doesn't it sees a packet coming in that hasn't been requested by one of the computers inside, it goes, I don't know what to do with that because no one's asked for this data. So you're not having, nobody's having a conversation with you, and it just drops it. It ignores it. That's why we say routers are firewalls. Because in effect, unless they've been instructed to handle some kinds of traffic in a certain way, for instance, saying, hey, if anything comes in on that port, send it to the Xbox because it's a gaming request. Unless we do that, port forwarding it's called it will just ignore anything that's not part of an existing conversation that's exactly what you want now i'm not sure how your internet service provider is working this but in effect they've moved the router out of your house into their premises and right. uh i'm not sure why they do that uh if they've configured that router the same as you would configure the router at home without any port forwarding without any opening any holes then you're just as secure as you would be at home. But what we don't know is what they're doing. Right. This might be, and I'm not an expert on WISPs on wireless internet service providers. This might be common practice. Um, we do have uh, have friends who run WISPs, uh, and I should ask them. I'm not sure why they're doing this or what the practice would be, and you don't really know. However, you have a router in between that router and the other router. It's not doing DHCP. It's not assigning addresses. But... Um, it is somewhat some protection. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to think actually of, of what kind of protection uh, it would provide. Uh, so the 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 internet service provider's router is the one that says, "Hey, do you have a conversation going?" And right. and it it can in effect because you're in bridge mode, it can see each individual internal computer. I think it is somewhat risky. Um. That's that's what I'm trying to get to the bottom of. Yeah, so I think it really depends on what... I, you, you could call your ISP and say, hey, what are you doing and why are you doing it this way? Yeah. Um, I, could see if, I could see them doing that if they say, oh, we don't want you to use five computers. We want to... Con probably they're doing this because they want to control bandwidth. Well, they, they tightly control the bandwidth. Yeah, that's sure. probably why. So one of the things a router can do is say this computer gets this much bandwidth this computer gets this much and if you're trying to do skype you only get this much so they can bandwidth shape and they can do a yeah. better job by by having the, the your router in their premises and i think i'm yeah. sure that's why they do that um uh, you just kind of you know there are other things you can do to make it more secure for sure some of which uh, in fact all of which will violate their terms of service for instance they say you have to put your router in bridge mode. You could protect yourself by not using it in bridge mode. That, I couldn't connect, though. I couldn't well, connect. Well, they they, they're going to try to prevent that because that means they can no longer see into your network and see which computers are doing what. Right. So uh, I am, I'm not sure exactly. I can understand why they do it. You can run security devices, but I think it's going to, in every case, it's going to violate the terms of service. They don't want you to do anything with the traffic. They want to control the traffic. Yeah. Well, okay, so Leo. What so if you turn on your NAT, if you say do DHCP, it just won't, they won't, you can't use it. Right, exactly. That's interesting. I don't know how they're doing that. Um, I know what kind of equipment they're using, if that makes a difference. What are they using? They're using the Ubiquity. Ah, yeah, Ubiquity's good, and that's exactly why you'd use Ubiquity. So you actually yeah. aren't using microwave. It's Wi-Fi. Yeah, you have the Wi-Fi. I've got a it's small a, dish a, on the roof. It's just a long-range Wi-Fi. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I meant at point-to-point. Point. I, I said point-to-point, point, but yeah, you're right. It's a long-range Wi-Fi. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I don't know. I'm not expert enough to know. But uh, I do know that there, yes, there's risk inherent in that if you have to trust them to uh, <laughs> do this properly.
Great. <laughs> so, so, so we are, but they're, but by the way, they're using good gear. Ubiquity's good gear. Yeah. That's industrial yeah. strength uh, Wi-Fi. But I, I can tell that they're eking out the the uh, bandwidth. They they're very stingy with yeah, the yeah. bandwidth. Yeah, that's. I'm pretty sure why they're doing it. And they obviously have something going on uh, where they can tell if you're doing your own NAT. And they, and they yeah. just say, good, we're not going to connect to him because we need to control this. Which right. means if you put a fire, you know, you put a, you got a, a professional firewall in there or anything like that, they probably they probably wouldn't work. They'd probably block it. Yeah. Because they want well, absolute tend, control. I, I tend to use my Verizon, uh, the, the data on the phone, because it's a faster connection anyways. Um, yeah, I you know, I will have to ask Brett and Brick Glass and who's a wisp out of Laramie, Wyoming. Uh, he will know what they're doing. I'll have to do some research on this for you. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, I'm not I'm just not familiar enough. Maybe uh, Dane Jasper over at Sonic would know this. It's an it's a really interesting question. So he can't use a second router. So if you listen clearly to what he said, they will not. Ha they will only allow that his personal router to be in bridge mode. He cannot use a second router. The Tech Guy Show this week brought to you as always the podcast by the Ring Video Doorbell. I love. You know, even when we were on the boat, <laughs> it was so cool. Here we are in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and I hear don don on my Ring Doorbell. I could see it was coming and going. We had Mario. Uh, Lisa's nephew watching the house, and I wanted to know what was going on. Was he having a party? The Ring Video doorbell is awesome. So what is it? It is a doorbell with a camera, speaker, and microphone. And uh, it, it's just awesome. It replaces your existing doorbell, so you don't have to, you know, if you've got a wired doorbell, it's really easy to install it. You just take off the old doorbell and put on the ring. They even give you all the tools in the box, to, you know, with a level and a screwdriver, drill bit, and everything. Uh, and then, uh, when just like your regular doorbell, when somebody presses the button, it rings the... There it is. It rings the doorbell. But it does so much more. Because not only does it ring the doorbell in my house... And by the way, you don't have to have a wired doorbell. This has a lithium-ion battery good for a year. You have It's a recharging port on the back, so you can recharge it after a year. And they even sell a little chime device plugs into the wall that connects to the ring. So you can add a doorbell to anything. I'm thinking of putting this on the bedroom door. Hello? I told you to knock. Anyway, here's the deal with the Ring Video Doorbell. You connect it up. You connect it to your Wi-Fi. And now, when anybody rings your doorbell, you can hear it anywhere on your smartphone, including at sea on a boat. You can even talk to the people at your door. And it's not just ringing your doorbell. This has a motion detector in it, too. So if there is anybody going by or, you know, FedEx leaves a package and you want to keep an eye on the package, you could do all of that. Ring video doorbell. It's like caller ID for your house. And since most home break-ins occur when somebody's not home, this way you can kind of keep an eye on things. They, they usually come up. The bad guy comes up, rings your doorbell. When you don't answer, goes around the back, breaks in. But this way you can answer. And you've got crystal clear HD video of them as well. I love my ring. I was able to answer the door from a boat, from a cruise ship. I want you to go to ring.com slash tech guy. You'll get free expedited FedEx shipping on your ring video doorbell. I have so many friends now who install this. In fact, so many of our employees have installed this <laughs> that when the when their ring goes off on their phone, I look up, I go, what? Who's that? Is that me? There's the ring chime. See? Never miss a ding. Ring.com slash Tech Guy. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy, 8888. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. And Stephen is on the line from San Marcos, California. Hi, Stephen. Hi. Welcome. Yes, you were talking about the 18 uh, wheelers, I mean, the big rigs, yeah. and autonomous driving. Wow. And they, um, they are licensed now in Nevada. Yeah, Nevada, it's interesting. California has kind of taken a step backward where we are in autonomous vehicles. They now require pedals and a driver, at least yeah, for passenger, for for passenger, passenger cars. Vehicle. I don't know about trucks. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, Nevada's been, uh, and I think Nevada wants to be in the forefront on autonomous cars. We're going to, you know, it's going to happen. 
And it, by the way, it ain't going to happen in Nevada, I don't think. It's Maybe it'll happen in Vegas. Where you're going to see a, autonomous vehicles, widespread use of autonomous passenger vehicles is going to be in big cities. They'll be, yeah. I, I believe, they'll be, uh, a, the, part of the problem with an autonomous vehicle, and this is true of trucks too, is not the autonomous vehicle, but the humans. Humans are unpredictable. And all the wrecks that have occurred with the Google self-driving cars have been caused by humans. If it were, if they were all autonomous, I think it'd be much safer. A bunch of it. And that's what worries me about having a lot of autonomous trucks on the road. It's not the trucks that worry me; it's the humans around them. And if you do, you drive trucks? Yes, I have a Class A. Yeah, you know, the big problem for you is not you. It's those cars trying to sneak in under your wheels. Oh, all the time. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not you. You have to be very, a very good defensive driver uh, to drive a truck. Yes, and I also do the ports. So, I mean, it's even crazier. Yeah. And, and we're looking with the aut autonomous systems, and they're talking about platoon formation where the trucks will actually talk to each other and allow us to save between 3 and 7% more fuel by the trucks driving driving themselves wow. in a five-platoon uh, formation. They're drafting. They're drafting. Exactly. Wow. And it's all on the, on the, uh, the fuel cost. I could see, you know, that's what's going to drive this. It's not just fuel costs, it's insurance costs. And I'm sure insurers in the next few years will start offering massive discounts for self-driving vehicles, and, and that's going to also help this along you know and if you go to the port um not in the u.s so much because the the unions are very strong but in many uh, international ports are completely uh, autonomous they're all uh, automated they're uh, working that it, it's getting towards that they're talking about adding an, an x filler on it for uh, uh containerized loads right and in a with the autonomous so and we could have doubles you know a Turn around and uh, going down the road. Yep. And so you'd be 80 feet long. And <laughs> oh, that's scary. And have five of us <laughs> running in a platoon. Wow. Wow. How interesting. Well, so do you think, uh, uh, well, I guess it, it, the problem is it, it, if Nevada says it's okay, but California doesn't, you're not, you're not really going to make it. You need it. It needs to be, uh, I mean, most of these It'll trucks are fun. interstate or interstate traffic, right? It's true, but it, it's just going to be time. I think it's going to happen. I do think it's going to happen. And it's going to happen in a some way because, look, at as drivers, as humans, we're scared of this whole thing. I'm not, The idea of me getting in a car with no steering wheel, no brake, and no gas, and just sitting there like a living room and having it deliver me is terrifying. Yeah, but how many moms are going to flop the kid in the car to turn around and send them off to school? Yeah, I mean, the car will already park itself. I know. We're just going to have to get used to it. And that's why I think it's going to happen in very constrained environments at first. We were talking about this yesterday on our, our uh, Screensavers show and uh, uh, with uh, Sam uh, Abul uh, Samid, who is a uh, uh, motor, motor uh, driving analyst, car analyst for Navigant. He says he thinks it's going to happen in the inner cities. They'll have no drive zones. They'll have autonomous only zones. And you'll park your car on the perimeter and an Uber will pull up. Or a lift will pull up, and you'll get in, and that's how you'll get around in the city. It will save, it will improve congestion, eliminate parking issues. It's going to be a big improvement in cities, and that will be our first exposure. And as we, and of course, it's not high speed. The worst you could get is a fender bender, uh, and because all of the vehicles will be autonomous, I guess pedestrians will be the big threat. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but Leo, yeah, it, they also now it's over in Europe right at the moment, but it's being looked at here in the and. I think it's at a dairy. There is a 10-mile stretch where drives itself, you know, parks, is uh, autonomously loaded with materials, drives the 10 miles to the distribution, yeah. backed up, yeah. opens, and, and it's completely self-driving. Those environments, yeah. it makes perfect sense because, they're, they're, it, you know, uh, if it's all computers and they're communicating, you know, they're not going to run into each other. It's like a, yeah, it's like an assembly line. It's not going to run into each other. But as soon as you add the human element, we're terrible. We're unpredictable. We're scary for computers. Yeah. yeah. But I, I do think it's going to happen. I, I absolutely think it's going to happen. Now, let me ask you this, and I didn't, I didn't raise this issue. 
you know, more than one and a half percent of our population makes its living driving. There's going to be a lot oh. of people out of work. Yes. And in fact, if you want a comparison at the beginning, I think it was aero trucking about what, five, maybe seven years ago, turned around and went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And you had, I think it was almost half a percent. And it, it was just devastating across the, uh, the U S yeah. for, for drivers. Uh, and, and that was on one half percent. Yeah. Terrible. It's very scary. Uh, and I oh, think yeah. that's that's another thing to consider. I mean, you know, it's it's a problem in, well, in many like industries. A, yeah, electronic logbooks is the big thing right at the moment. Right. And and by the way, a lot of people make money on Uber. Uber is going to go automated as quickly as they possibly can. They're they're spending a lot of money in in working on this. I think it's on our horizon. Uh, I don't think it's more than ten years off. At least in in urban areas and places like that. Hey, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Bob, Discovery Bay, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Bob. Hello. Welcome to the show. So you want a Windows uh, yeah. Windows tablet, huh? Yes, sir, for work. Yes, I'm an IT professional, and I need something to run all the same programs on my own. PC, laptop, on the tablet to make things easier to carry around. I got to say, I'm a huge fan of the Microsoft tablets, the Surface and they have a Surface and a Surface Pro, and uh, Surface may be all you need if you have the desktop as well. Uh, of course, Lenovo makes some good tablets. Asus and Acer also make Windows tablets. In some cases, you're going to save money uh, because Microsoft Surface is premium priced. Um, but I wouldn't. I would not hesitate to uh, look at Lenovo. You you probably already know Lenovo pretty well if you work in IT. They're they're kind of the oh, yeah, yeah. that's the go to company. Yeah, I don't uh, know. I remember you mentioned you did a um, the wind book a while back. I was looking at that. They're cheap. They're cheap. <laughs> so I paid sixty bucks for my wind book eight inch tablet. <laughs> um, not sure I could recommend it. I can only recommend it because it's inexpensive. How do you need yeah. it? You know, Lenovo makes a um, seven inch. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, 10-inch Windows tablet, and that's probably as small as you'd want to go, for 250 bucks. I wouldn't go below yeah. that. Yeah, well, well, obviously bigger is better. Bigger than yeah, bigger. 10 inches is about as small as I'd go. I noticed with the 7- and 8-inch tablets, they're, they're convenient, but, boy, it's hard to do anything serious on them. But 250 bucks, 10-inch, that's small enough. That's like an iPad size. It's got real windows on it. It's got multi-point touch, which you want, and it's upgradable. I think this is a good way to go. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about computers and the Internet and home theater and digital photography, smartphones, smart watches. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone Number Lisa is in Cypress, California. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. My I really pleasure. Thank you for calling. What can I, I do for you? I have an iPhone, and I'm not very technical smart here. Mm -hmm. um, but I have 300 some pictures of my two grandkids on it, and I want to save them so I don't lose them. How do I, um, what's the best way to save my pictures and then be able to retrieve them when I want to look at them or print them out? Yeah, because you can run out of space pretty easily on an iPhone. A lot of people um, just take pictures until they run out of space. <laughs> and then they go, oh, no, what do I do now? So I'm glad you asked before. I think with 300 pictures, you probably haven't run out of space yet. Oh, good. No, you probably have lots of room. Um, but the other problem is what if you lose the phone? Those are your, that's, you don't have a backup. So there's a couple of ways to do this, Apple-approved ways to do this. Uh, and then there's some other ways I'll tell you about as well. In fact, I would use more than one because you don't want to lose your pictures. No, not these. These are valuable. So Apple, um, uh, for the longest time, wanted you to connect your phone to the computer using and use iTunes. And when you connect, do you have a Mac or a PC? I have a PC. Okay. When you connect to the computer on a PC... Uh, as soon as the computer sees your iPhone, it should launch 
uh, a photo app and allow you to copy the photos over. Okay. So, so that's number one. That's the fastest way to do it. Not I, In my opinion, not the best way. Apple also allows you to use iCloud. And if you keep your iPhone up to date, I don't know, is it? have you updated it or is it an older version of the operator? What iOS version do you know? I got this um, in July. It's oh, yeah. Beautiful. So you're, okay. Um, and you probably updated it. it. Well, it keeps wanting me to do the iCloud, but I keep putting it off because I've been wanting to ask you. Well, what that's what the finish. iCloud's for. But they only give you five gigabytes of storage for free. Okay. So, but that's another way. And that, if you turn on the iCloud photo library, what Apple does is copies the phone's pictures, the originals, which are on the phone, to the internet and then eliminates them from your phone, but puts low, not low quality, but lesser quality, smaller images on your phone to save space. But they're as good as they need to be for that screen. There's okay. another way to do it that's, I think, a great way and free, and that's Google. Google has a Photos app as well, and you can find it on the App Store, Google Photos. Photos app? Yeah, it's called Google Photos. Okay. And when you install it, you can turn it on to automatically back up every picture you take for free. Oh, wow. And then, if you, you must have a Google account. Everybody does, a Gmail account. Yeah, yeah. So then when you go to photos.google.com and, and log into your account, They'll be there, and it makes it very easy, by the way, to share them. You can you can share photos with people. You can say make a folder that they can upload to as well. So if you have an event and you want everybody to upload their pictures to the same folder, you can do that and share it. Apple allows you to do that too. The difference is Apple charges you for storage. Google does not. Okay. Amazon, if you're an Amazon Prime member, also has unlimited free storage of your photos. Flickr, which is a Yahoo photo sharing site, gives you a terabyte for free. That's more than you'd ever need. And in all cases, you'd get their app, download, and it would automatically upload every picture you take. I like to do that with at least one of those services because that's kind of like an automatic backup. So if the you know if I took a picture and five minutes later lost the phone, I'd still have that picture. <laughs> what was the last one you mentioned with the terabyte? Well, I can go on and on. There's Flickr, <laughs> Flickr.com. Okay. Microsoft has OneDrive. That also has uh, storage. Amazon Prime, Flickr, and Google are all unlimited free storage. Now, Google will lower the quality slightly. I've not noticed any difference. Um, and if, if you allow them to do that, then they give you unlimited storage. iCloud isn't that expensive. I have a 200 gigabyte account for two bucks a month. And that's more than enough for all of my storage. So if you feel most comfortable letting Apple do it, what I would do is turn on iCloud Photo Drive. It's in your settings for iCloud. Maybe buy a little extra storage because 5 gigabytes, the base free amount, is not very much. But it, it's enough for those photos for sure. Uh, and then get one other service just to have a second service. I'd recommend Google Photos. Okay. Thank you. That sounds perfect. Yeah. And then you'll have two copies you actually have three. You'll have one on your phone, you'll have one on Apple, uh, the iCloud, and one on Google. And there's very little likelihood that you would now lose any of those pictures. And both iCloud and Google have have uh, features for sharing with your grandkids and other family oh. members. Oh, great. Oh, well, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for calling. I appreciate it. Google Photos was, in I think in many people's minds, uh, the product of the year in 2015. Uh, because of the unlimited free storage, but also because Google uses a lot of intelligence. You know, it's it's the king of search, right? To allow you to very quickly find photos. So it has face recognition. That's the first thing. You could say, this is, you know, granddaughter Sally. This is granddaughter Tommy, grandson Tommy. And it will then continue to make a folder with Tommy pictures. And it's very good at it. But you can also say things like, I want to see those pictures from Paris I took. You type in Paris and all your Paris pictures. I did this with Google Photos. I, I Just as an experiment, I typed in churches. And it wasn't perfect. It thought, uh, it thought that the uh, Acropolis in Greece was a church. Hey, close enough. Uh, so the search features, in, and if you go to photos.google.com, you'll see it does face recognition. It does places. It'll offer you some. But I just typed churches. And it gave me hundreds of pictures, 
pretty good job, frankly, of uh, churches and church-like edifices. This is automatic. You don't have to go in there and say, okay, that's a church. Okay, that's a baseball game. It just does it. I think that's pretty cool. And, uh, and you'll see it does the default uh, face recognition. Um, but it also, you know, we were just in Vienna. So it said, oh, well, I recognize that all of those iPhone photos were taken in Vienna. We're going to put them in a folder. And there's all my pictures of Vienna in one place. It saves a lot of time. You don't have to do a lot of categorization anymore. So I think it's fine to use iCloud. Uh, I mean, after all, you have an iPhone. It's kind of the natural default. But I I would tr I would go uh, just go to the app store and download Google Photos and try it. I think you'll like it. You do have to go in there and turn on the upload feature. There's settings you can say don't only do it when I'm on Wi-Fi. You might want to do that so you don't use up your bandwidth, your precious bandwidth. I leave it on all the time because I want every time I take a picture, I want it to upload automatically. In fact, I have a I have a fancier camera that I take pictures with, a Sony. A lot of cameras do this. Nikon does it. A lot of cameras do it. That I can then. It has Wi-Fi in the camera. I can then say, okay, copy all the pictures I took today to my smartphone, to my iPhone. Press a button. I, it does that. It does it fairly quickly. And then Google and iCloud will automatically save those too. So the last time I took a trip, that's why I have all these pictures of Vienna. I didn't take them on my iPhone. I took them on my fancy Sony camera. But then I made sure at the end of every day to copy those pictures over wirelessly, automatically to my phone and then have them uploaded. Worked very nicely. It solves a problem, too, because, of course, as you travel, backup of your images becomes a, a big deal. You don't want to lose those. Or you get pictures of your grandkids. The main thing to remember is don't, and, you know, I, I have many family members who do this, so I'm very aware of this. Don't just take pictures forever and just assume they're going to stay and be all right. You don't want to lose those. And eventually, you'll fill up the phone. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's the phone number. Let's talk. High tech. Leo Laporte. The Tech Guy. Remember the website, techguylabs.com. It's free, no sign up, and uh, all the answers to all our questions are right there. Three, copies of everything. One. Three two, one. Yep. Yes. Three, two, one, backup. I'm like, everyone yeah, good. Don't yeah, yeah. No, and it's sad because uh, those photos are among the most treasured things. You know, I finally got around. I've been taking uh, digital photos since 2001, so I finally got around to putting all the pictures I've ever taken up on some cloud service, um, most of them on every cloud service. <laughs> and it's great because I have pictures of the kids when they were little and stuff, and they're just they're all there. But, I, but Google Photos is the most amazing because I, uh, you know, I could just search for my son – and uh, find all the pictures I have of my son going back quite a way. And it's amazing how it knows baby pictures are It does a good job. It does a good job. I mean, these I just can go on and on. I wonder how long. Was it? <laughs> yeah, it, it knew that these pictures, uh, that these, these baby pictures, it knew that that was my son. I mean, that's an old picture, you know. It knows all of the baby pictures. So, in fact, what it was kind of a nice thing because it also does video, and uh, I had taken a video <laughs> with one of my first digital cameras of my son reading for the first time uh, out loud, and Google found it. You know, I was just I was looking at pictures of my son. I said, "Wait a minute, this is from 2002. This is my son reading for the first time, reading out loud to me." And Google had saved it and made it possible to find, which was awesome. But, um, well, I'll, I'll still do it because he said that um, I had to do it for you, <laughs> so I'll do it. I said, we're going to, okay, we can read for Grandma. <laughs> but is this the first page? Uh-huh. Okay. Ta so having this is priceless. It was... Frog and Toad. Fitting, fitting, I love that Yeah, because yeah, it was a it was an Olympus C thirty thirty. It was a three Frog. megapixel camera. It wasn't. This is two thousand two. It's my I think one of my first digital cameras. Oh. Uh, 
But having this, priceless. I mean, really priceless. I wish I had this for Abby. He's wearing a Hogwarts t-shirt. <laughs> I saw an adult man wearing that yesterday. That's a little disturbing. weird. It's disturbing, yeah. Yeah, that's a little weird. So it's so nice to have this. What? Yeah, I read Goodnight Moon. We went through so many um, copies of Goodnight Moon. Because <laughs> Abby, when I first started reading it to her, when she was really little, she'd, tear, she'd eat it. <laughs> she'd tear <laughs> off the... So we went through a lot of copies. Eventually we cut a cloth version that she couldn't eat. And then for Henry, we did it. Oh, yeah, we read Good Light Moonlight. Did she have, like, a fiber deficiency or no, something? No, she was just little. She was a little girl. She didn't know books weren't for eating. That frog and toad, man. Isn't frog and toad funny. awesome? Toad's kind of mean, right? To frog, yeah. sounds like the big dumb one. Is yeah, that's why Henry liked it. Oh, it's great. Oh, this is kinda so wily. funny. So I typed Abby, and <laughs> oh. I think it's pulling up. This is Milk Abby. This is the... Uh, wow. The, but it's A-B-B-E-Y, so apparently Google's not good at spelling or assumes I'm not good at spelling because it's more likely, right? So this is pictures of my daughter, Abby, and the milk, Abby. <laughs> so that's actually probably the right thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let me see how they far back. They want to give back. you all options. goes pretty far back. Yeah, here's Abby as a little girl. It goes all the way back. This is from 1998. 2000. Pretty cool to have that. That's really God. nice. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, I miss first reading to my kids. I read them the first six Harry Potter books, or five, and then Abby just took it and said, I'm reading it to myself. <laughs> You're too slow. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888, ask Leo. Yeah, really, is the we were just talking off the air about Google Photos, and what a marvel. That is, it's a f completely free service, and uh, probably if you had, if you looked back at 2015 and all of the interesting innovations and inventions and apps, that's got to be the biggest. Photos.google.com, and if you're not taking advantage of it, if you take a lot of pictures, even just camera phone pictures, you really ought to take a look at it. Pretty impressive. Renee in San Bernardino, California. Hi, Renee. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. How you doing, Leo? This is a first-time caller. Um, Welcome. Oh. Nice to have you. Okay, a uh, Bluetooth transmitter. My wife is tired of all the wires. So I want a Bluetooth transmitter. What's your recommendation for that? All right, well, tell me what you're transmitting and what you're receiving. What is it that you want to do? I have everything connected to an old-school stereo. It ah. does have an optical audio. So you want to uh, listen to your stereo? What do you want to do? Yes. Without the wires. That, that and you want to use headphones? No, no, no. I want to use speakers, you regular want, speakers. You want Bluetooth speakers. Does your That's why you want a transmitter, because your stereo doesn't do Bluetooth. Yes. And I, actually, my wife's going to get a get a surround sound you know, a bar, sound bar. But also, can we utilize the old speakers as well? Um, yeah, there's lots of ways uh, to do this. Uh so, you, so Bluetooth speakers are powered speakers, obviously, because no amplifier is connected to them. You, they're either battery powered or they're plugged into the wall. And you can put them anywhere, but Bluetooth's range is limited. It's about 30 feet. So okay. you probably can get them in the next room, but not the next room after that. Okay. All right. And there certainly are uh, Bluetooth transmitters. You said you have optical out? Yes. That would be the nicest way to do it. I don't know if anybody makes a Bluetooth optical system. There's, oh, an there's another way to go um, that might be kind of intriguing for you, and I'll mention that. It's a little more expensive, but let me just see. We need a Bluetooth transmitter. Uh, I see, you know, like they're 10 bucks on Amazon. They're not very expensive. Most of them, are, though, are analog. They're not uh, optical out. Okay, and that's just with the... Um and then you just pair the speakers to the Bluetooth transmitter, right? Yes. So, I mean, I, I've i bought a number of these. They're not expensive. Here's one called Azeka. It's 28 bucks. It's got an, an analog, you know, the like the, the mini, um, mini jack. So it would go into the headphone. Most of them are like that, so they can go into the headphone jack of something. And everything has that. 
So that would be the best route and cheapest route is through that? Well, all? yeah, I mean, Bluetooth is pretty good. It depends on, you know, okay, so now I'm going to tell you, that's the inexpensive route. Okay. Now we can get a little more expensive with things like Sonos speakers. So Sonos is a, a wireless speaker system designed to get sound in all, your whole home. And it's a, it, but it is expensive. It's hundreds of dollars per speaker system. And what you'll do with Sonos is you'll connect, and I do it via optical, a base station to your stereo via optical. Um, and uh, you also connect it to the internet. The advantage of, of Sonos is it can not only play uh, your music, it can play, it can play from the internet. Does that have interest to you? Uh, Pandora, Spotify, that kind of stuff? I'm a bit frugal, so... No, you're kind of frugal. Stuff. Then do what you want to do. Your but, original uh, plan. Inexpensive. They range from 8 bucks to 30 bucks. Bluetooth transmitter. As far as I can tell, they're all about the same. Okay. And uh, and and you'll and then you'll just get uh, speakers, and you can. By the way, the range on prices is wild on those. I mean, you can go from twenty dollars to a thousand bucks. On the on the speakers, I also seem they have uh, receivers, so that would be connected to the speaker. Then you eliminate the wires, right? Yep, they're wireless. Wireless. Yep. You just make your speakers wireless. Is that correct? Yeah. So they what they do is they pair to your Bluetooth transmitter, which is connected to your stereo. Okay. Um, and, you know, now somebody sent me a link to a Bluetooth transmitter from Nolan, N O L A N, but it's 100 bucks. Looks more fancy. <laughs> it does do longer range. So if you if 30 feet is not enough, you'd like to go to 100 feet or more, uh, this might be a better solution. And this will take optical, which is probably going to be better quality than analog. It'll take a spit if in and out. So this is maybe another good solution. This is from Nolan. We'll put a links to a variety of these products in the show notes at techguylabs.com. Okay, so optical will be the best route. Yeah, because uh, you might as well keep it digital, right? Yes. Um, and yeah, I mean, so uh, there's so many companies make Bluetooth uh, speakers. I use a, a Bose Bose Sound Link Color Sound Links. They're about eighty bucks. Sound good. You can get stereo speakers. I also have a very, very, very very expensive JBL system. Uh, JBL is very well known for their studio monitors and speakers for stereos from the old days. And uh, I bought, <laughs> foolishly, for about 800 bucks, bought a, a, a JBL system that has Bluetooth and, uh, you know, AirPlay and DL and every possible form of wireless. You should inquire. You know, you look at, look at your stereo because your transmitter may have some other wireless technology built into it. Uh, it may have AirPlay or DLNA, some other system built into it. You may not need it by a transmitter, but Bluetooth is a way to do it if you don't already have it. 8888 Ask Leo. Thanks again to the chat room. Those guys are great. Lots of recommendations, including that Nolan. I'm a big fan of Chromecast audio, but that's really more about getting internet audio into your speaker. But once you have that wireless speaker, you might want to look at that. 35 bucks plugs into the speaker, attaches to your Wi Fi. And then you can use your smartphone to pick Pandora or Spotify and play right into your uh, stereo system uh, or into your remote speakers. So that's a, you know, you can get fancy. But you said you were frugal, so let's be frugal. Let's go to Temecula. Frank is on the line. Hi, Frank. Hi, Leo. Thanks for taking my call. My pleasure. Thanks for calling. What can I do for you? Um, I actually called a long time ago. I'm the Marine who snapped my laptop in half, <laughs> yeah. turned it into a desktop. <laughs> yeah. I remember um, very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not too good with technology, but my question today for you is I bought a knobby for my daughter about a year ago, and uh, it won't charge. It won't even turn on. Uh, uh, the warranty's expired. So, you know, I, I'm kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. Oh, uh, that's sad. Yeah, money's kind of tight and all that, but... Um, so the Nobby is a tablet for kids, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, like... Here's what I would... Re you know, if you can't get service, here's what I'd recommend as an alternative. Amazon makes a Kindle for kids. It's inexpensive. Okay. It's under 100... Well under 100 bucks. And they have a two-year warranty. If your kid breaks it for any reason, like throws it across the room, they'll replace it for free. Oh, Wow. 
it is a really good way to get kids into the Amazon ecosystem. It's the only, the only, <laughs> only reason I could think of it uh, why they might do this. Uh, so it's called the Fire HD Kids Edition. Starts at fifty bucks, and as I said, they replace it two years for any reason at all. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Actually, I'm wrong. It's not fifty bucks. To they make a fifty buck one. That's the one everybody bought. The kids edition is a hundred bucks. But given that it's kid proof, and I think better than the knobby, and if they break it, if you break it, if you snap it in half, <laughs> they'll replace it free. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, can't get enough of your calls, baby. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. Give me a ring if you got a question, a comment, a suggestion. You want to talk high tech? That's what I'm here for. Avis is on the line from Santa Ana. Hi, Avis. Hey there, Leo. I'm so glad you're there. I'm trying to uh, finish this little project. And it is, I bought myself an after Christmas present. It's a uh, Sony TV. Uh, and I'll read to you. Aren't those the best presents? No one gave me a TV. I'm buying myself one. You better believe. <laughs> Love those. It's a uh, 4K. Good. UHD smart TV, yeah. built-in Wi-Fi Android. Yeah. 75 inch. I've got no. out nice. here. Yeah. And I have two things about it that I don't know. My nephew set it up for me, and uh, I had a HDMI cable from a, some other hookup. And I don't know if this cable will give me 4K. Well... First of all, you got to have something that has 4K on it. What do you... Okay, how do I know program <laughs> is 4K? Oh, it'll tell you in big, loud letters because uh, so few things are. The only way right now to get 4K is over the Internet with Netflix or Vudu. And it's not all their stuff. It's just some of their stuff is in 4K. And because you're getting it over the Internet, it's highly compressed. And it's not going to give you all the benefit. Really, 4K, your TV set is not going to sing until they mm -hmm. come out with 4K Blu-ray players, which they will have soon. Oh. That's what you really... They, so until then, it's kind of... I don't know if you remember or bought an HD TV when they first came out. But when they first no. came out, there was no HD content to watch. So oh. what they would do is upsample. They would take the existing DVDs, your 480, which is a 480p, and they would upsample it to 1080p. And, and they, you know, a good TV, and your Sony is a very good TV, would do a decent job. So most of what you're seeing is upsampled HD content. Okay. Okay, so I'm okay with the HDMI cable that I have there now. It says it's high speed with Ethernet, but 4K it doesn't have anything to do with speed. Is that just resolution? Well, it does in a way because the more picture, yes, resolution, the more pixels on the screen, 4K is four times the pixels, double the number of pixels across and from top to bottom. Okay. It's also called, and as, it, as you noticed in your TV, UHD or Ultra HD. Uh, yeah. An Ultra HD uh, stream not only is higher resolution, but there's more data. And that's one of the reasons I'm not really uh, selling the idea of getting 4K on a, on a stream from Netflix or Vudu because you, unless you have super high speed internet and they don't compress it much, you're not gonna, it's not going to really look 4K. You, you'll, see an ultra, you'll see the difference with ultra high def when you get an ultra high def Blu-ray player. And then you will see a difference. It's going to be like you're looking through a window. It's amazing. Oh, that sounds cool. Well, uh, that leads me to the question number two, um, the 3D glasses. <laughs> what about the 3D that Sony... Well, my nephew turned on the station and he hit a button and it gave you the 3D. We yeah. didn't have the glasses, but I could see, you know, the two... Well, yeah, you don't want to watch 3D without the glasses because it looks like your, <laughs> your vision's going. Uh, yeah. So yeah, you could. So Sony didn't. It didn't include glasses. That means you have to buy them. Yes. I wouldn't. I don't. I'm not a fan of 3D, but uh, it's gimmicky oh. to me. So I wouldn't worry about it. Oh, 
Okay. Uh, well, the sales rep, of course, that's why I'm checking with you here. He says, oh, you got to get a Blu-ray player and, and a movie well, that is 3D with Blu-ray, and that'll give you the best depth. Yeah, well, yeah, but yeah. well um, have you ever seen a 3D movie in the theater? Yeah. What do you think? Uh, they're kind of fun once in a while. Yeah. You know. So if you think it's fun and, um, you know, the glasses have to be charged, they have yeah. batteries in them. Uh, yeah. And so you'll plug it into the back of the TV, you keep them charged, and then when 3D content comes on, sometimes even broadcast television has 3D content, your TV will notice. By the way, the TV does notice and says, hey, it's 3D, you want to go 3D? And you say yes, put on your glasses, oh. and then uh, snowflakes will fall in your lap and, and birds <laughs> will fly into your face. And yeah, If you like it in the movie theater, really the best way to judge is, do you like it in the movie theater? Um, yeah. Then maybe. Any Blu-ray disc player you get today will have that capability so don't worry about that you probably okay. should get a blu-ray player because you're not you know but but you might want to wait it's just a matter of months before uhd blu-ray comes out now, okay i will do that i will do that okay oh, i know I wrote, I wrote all my questions down so i can't use passive glasses with well, you have to use whatever the sony system is uh some okay. some systems use passive some use active. I'm thinking Sony uses active, but I may be wrong on that. Um, You're right. Yeah, you'll have to get whatever the Sony brand is. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. That answers that. Thank you so much, Lee. I appreciate it. Hey, are you enjoying it already? I bet you are. Oh, yeah. Uh, the manual on all the programming. Right now I have four remotes. One for the sound. Yeah. One for Time Warner. One yeah. for the TV. You know, and I'm trying to figure out how to uh, bring them all together. No, and what, you know, there are universal remotes, you know, Harmony from Logitech. They're excellent. But in my opinion, you yeah. just get used to it. And you know, well, I have to turn this on and this on and this on and this on. And you just get used to yeah. it. Uh, okay, okay. It's good right. to know how it works. We if, got Leo in the background here. We got a Leo here, too. Oh, good. Is Leo still there setting up the TV? Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, all right. this Leo is a 180-pound bull mastiff. Oh, he's uh, not helping at all. <laughs> oh, no. He, I was going to get a security system for the house. No, that'll do. <laughs> that will do. No, that 75 inches should look great. Now, don't sit too far away from it. You Believe it or not, you, you don't want to be more than, say, 10 or 15 feet away. You want it to almost fill your vision, and it's going to look great. You're going to love it. The, oh. the TV you're getting from the cable is HD. It'll look great. But... That capability, that TV has capability in the uh, years to come, months and years to come, uh, of, of really looking amazing. And that will happen when you get a UHD player. You, your UHD Blu-ray player will probably set you back. The initial ones are going to be about 500 bucks. Uh, and they'll and as with all you know these things, they'll get cheaper. And by the end of the year, maybe it'll be only 200 bucks. So, but it is going to be a little pricey initially. But that's the only way you're going to really see what that TV is capable of. That's why the salesman, and say, remember, the salesman's trying to sell you a lot of extra stuff, including gold plated HDMI cables and things that are just a waste of money. Don't worry about those. What you got is fine. Stick with what you got. Don't, if you want 3D, you're going to buy the glasses. It's going to be 100 bucks or more. Um, and then you need a Blu ray player that supports 3D, or you need a source that supports 3D. I'm not a big fan of 3D. I think just wait. Get, the thing you're going to want for sure is the UHD Blu-ray player. Uh, if you if you like if you like a lot of movies and you want to buy discs, you can get a Blu-ray player now. But you're going to upgrade it in the next few months. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask uh, Leah. That's the number. I I have been waiting. I have waited. Uh, I do not have a 4K set. I have a 1080P set. And my advice to most people is wait until you there's something you want to see that's in 4K. Even with these Blu-ray players, these new UHD Blu-ray players, we talked with Scott Wilkinson, our home theater geek, the other day. There's only going to be 100 movies this year, 100 movies total in 4K. And most of them aren't movies you are going to ever want to see, unless you like watching, you know, Minions over and over again. Uh, it's going to be, it remember how it was with HD, it just takes a, takes a while, it takes a few years to catch up. However, having said that, I've seen 4K content on beautiful 4K displays. By the way, the bigger the better, and it looks great. On a 75-inch Sony in 4K with good 4K content, you'll be it's like looking through a picture window. It's amazing. 
It's just, you know, not really here yet. <laughs> You're an early adopter. 8888-ASK-LEO. We're going to do a final segment, wrap up this show for the week. When we come back, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, last segment of the show for uh, this week. But a reminder, the website uh, is 24-7, techguylabs.com. You can listen and watch older shows. You can see the answers to the questions. And most importantly, for me anyway, you can add your answers in the comments section. That's very valuable. And there's no charge. It's free. No sign-up even. Techguylabs.com. Greg is in Brea, California. Hi, Greg. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. How you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good, good. I just bought a home, and right now we're Congrats. actually listening to you. We tore the, we're tearing the house apart today, and we're listening to you while we're doing work. Nice. Hello. Oh. Are you using a sledgehammer to tear down those walls? We're doing karate kick, sledgehammer. <laughs> how Everything fun is else. that? Oh, it's a, it's a joy. I want to get this house like Jarvis, but Apple version. How can we do it? <laughs> you know, um, that was Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook. That's exactly the phrase he used. He said, this year I'm going to make my house like Jarvis uh, with with smarts. It is still a little bit of a geeky thing to do, home automation. And we were really hopeful that Apple would make it easy, as they've done with so many other things. Apple, Google, Microsoft, a lot of companies want to be in this business. Samsung. Uh, I would say Apple, you know, with its home kit, is in the long run probably in one of the best positions. You said you want to go Apple, so let's do it. Uh, okay. What, what surprised me, when they announced the new Apple TV, I thought, oh, that's going to be the home kit hub. No. They didn't, they didn't do that. I don't understand. You need a hub, right? Yes. Because uh, what you need is something that will talk to the devices, and then your phone will talk to the hub, and that makes it a lot easier. And I, I, ha I have to think Apple's planning this. And there's certainly at CES, there were a ton of HomeKit accessories, lights, plugs, locks. But as it stands right now, the hub is your iPhone or your iPad. Is that okay? Yeah. Can we, is there any way I can, we can do a cutout on our wall? Let's say you have an iPad mini built yeah. on the wall. Yeah, you could. I mean, I'm a, I'd be a little nervous about that because uh, technology changes so fast that I'm not sure, you know, <laughs> you know. but I guess the iPad size isn't going to change much. You get to put a 10-inch iPad in there. Um, what's really cool is the variety of things. So you've got uh, alarm systems. You've got Honeywell thermostats, Lutron uh, smart window shades and blinds. You've got fans. You've got the Eve, which is Elgato, uh, and Elgato's done great TV stuff for Apple for years. The Eve smart power outlet and light switch. So that's really critical, the ability to turn on a light switch or turn off power. Um, they've got the iDevices wall switch, dimmer switches. They've got water sensors. Schlage makes a deadbolt lock so you can unlock and lock your door. In most cases, these are intended to be used with your phone. Yeah, I'm looking to that Schlage. I'm thinking about getting the door lock. Yep. I'm also thinking about Apple on their website has these JBL speakers that you kind of, they're speakers with the LED light built in. What do you think about that? Sure. You know, I, this is, you know, really the idea here is you've decided to go with Apple, to trust Apple, and I think that's a fairly safe bet that Apple's really focused on usability. It won't be the least expensive solution out there, but it will not be the most complicated solution out there either, right? So yeah. this, this JBL thing is what is the, uh, it's a light with speakers built into it. So what do you think about that? Is that something that sounds appealing? I haven't heard them. Yeah, they're not the only ones doing this. The nice thing is, uh, you already have a you know a, a a hole in the ceiling for for spots, and yeah. and there's power, so you don't have to do additional wiring. You just screw in a light bulb. It happens to be a speaker as well. That seems yeah. like a great way to go. And the the other yeah. reason I like that is it's easy to upgrade, and that's why I'm worried about you cutting holes in the wall for a specific device because we don't know what the landscape's going to look like. So I, I do like these uh, these pulse lights. Uh, yes. 
They have, and JBL makes good speakers. I just haven't heard them. I would go to. The, here's what I would do: go to the Apple Store. Uh, there must be one near you. There, yeah, I'm Brea. Sure, you can go down to the Apple Store and listen. Say, see how it sounds. Um, yeah, we're down there. They don't have them in the showroom. Uh, you want to hear them before you buy them. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's Don't you? See if you heard them. They're 169 bucks. No, I. But I'll make a point of finding somewhere finding them. You know what? I should just do is buy some, shouldn't I? Yeah, I should sure. be the guinea pig for you. That would be awesome. Yeah, and again, I think really what you're going to want to do here is not necessarily build something in the wall, but really just everybody who has an iPhone is now connected to the stuff. And let's say you just have an iPad Mini laid. On a dock or you could do that machine. if you want, like a base station. Yeah, but presumably everybody in the family has an iPhone. I mean, that's what this is. That's what Apple wants. This is built around that. One more thing, may I suggest? As long as yes, you're sir. building out the house, consider and you could talk to an electrician about doing this. is much less expensive than you think. A whole home surge suppressor. Whole home surge suppressor. Yeah, electrician can do this. They put it in for you, and w the reason is you now have a lot of stuff like these speakers that are connected directly to your power. There's no surge protection for them. But you can get one that will do the whole house. And okay. in general, I recommend it. It's a lot less expensive than buy putting surge suppressors everywhere. And it will, to some degree, protect uh, this stuff. Because all of this stuff is going to be a little bit uh, vulnerable. Any particular model or anything? No, else? ask the electrician. He'll know what to do. It's now, last thing, I have a 4K Samsung TV. Nice. Just any good Apple apps to run it to go to be off the iPad or iPhones that we can just kind of control the lights in the TV. And oh, that's interesting. Well, get an Apple TV. This is why I was a little disappointed that Apple did not make that a HomeKit hub. Because then, exactly, you would then have the Apple remote and on your screen you'd see the whole house. You could say, turn that light on, close the garage door, unlock the house. You know, you could do all of it from your TV. And I, I'm fairly convinced that Apple plans to do this. They just didn't do it yet. I don't know why they didn't do this. I'm, I'm, I, everybody expected that that's, what, that's why Apple would do a new Apple TV, so it could be HomeKit. HomeKit is Apple's kind of standard for all of this. And the, the fact that they've made a standard makes it a lot, uh, I think, a lot better. And since you're an Apple guy, and that's the way to go. I don't know of a way to do it yet. Get an Apple TV. The new Apple TV is great anyway. You want it on that nice TV. It doesn't do 4K. Another maybe little bit of a miss on Apple's part. It doesn't do 4K. Uh, so you'll have to get a new one when, when they come out with 4K. But I think it could in software do HomeKit. Hey, have fun in the new house. That's going to be awesome. That's really going to be a great way to go, I think. And there are enough now devices that work with HomeKit that you're set. I mean, you're really everything you need. That's the problem with home uh, automation at this point uh, is really that there are a lot of different standards. There's Zigbee and, you know, uh, Apple's got their standards. Samsung's got their standard. Although Samsung's smart enough, they did the Smart Things uh, hub. They bought that company. And that talks to a variety of different protocols, but not all of them. They need. I really feel like this is this is what's holding this back. So it might be that going with Google or going with Google's not very advanced yet. They say they have a home automation strategy, but I don't see. A, I mean, they've got Brillo and we've got a lot of the infrastructure, but I don't see a lot of products coming out. It looks like Apple's got the lead. I would say Apple's the. If you're gonna, you want it, you want one thing. You already have iPhones. That's probably the way to way to go. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. Wait a minute. We're out of time. No more. For, no more calls. Thank you, Heather Haman. The Phone Ranger, thank you to our musical director, Nathan State, and most importantly, thank you for joining me. We'll be back next weekend right here. Come back. Let's talk high tech. It's an exciting world. But we all need a little hand-holding on the information superhighway. That's what I'm here for. See you next time. Leo Laporte, The Tech Guy. Well, that's it for The Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows on the Netcast Network. It's called TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. You even get your daily dose of tech news with Tech News Today and Tech News Tonight. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. 
And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.